here in Menlo Park. It's May 8th, 2005. And we have the great privilege and honor to be with Byron Katie, who likes to be called Katie, so I will do that. Good. Thank you, Jordan. It's good to be here. Yeah, thank you for making the time. It really makes a difference when people are willing to. Uh, show oh, you're so welcome. Rearrange their reality. Yeah. So as I've been reading your books and, and practicing the work a little bit, the, the, the first premise that you start with, that it's, it's thoughts that make people unhappy, that make them stressed out. You and bring them joy. And bring them joy. Uh -huh. Thoughts. Well, thoughts happen. They come through. And then we, we put a lot of, we place a lot of power on those thoughts. And as thoughts come through, the life of mind is to validate what it believes. So that makes a very busy mind. So thoughts are a good thing until they're not. And when they're not, whether we know it or not, a feeling will let us know. And we become stressed out or frustrated. And when that happens, that's the point where I invite people to question what they're believing. Because until they do, every time that thought enters or a thought like it, stress is going to reoccur. And we live our lives out of what we believe and our feelings. And then we react out of that. And, you know, I work with a lot of people in prison, and they're there because of they've lived out of their belief systems. So until we question our mind, as long as we believe what we think, our lives are lived out of what we believe. You know, you give that example of the snakes and really mm -hmm. being ropes. I've had similar things like that where, you know, an object out on the back deck turns out, you know, not to be a mountain lion. It's uh -huh. just a bucket. Uh -huh. And uh, I think it's a great metaphor that once you really realize most of what you use to make yourself unhappy with is, mm -hmm. is questionable. I mean, you bring up the very point that you can question your thoughts in a simple, gentle, ongoing way that yes. makes a difference. Yes, yes. You know, it's, it's really true, I've come to see. It's the truth that sets us free. And it's, it's just absolutely true. When we're believing something that isn't true for us, a feeling will let us know. Again, stress, frustration, resentment, so we question what I believe, and it shifts, it changes. And the next time that thought comes in, next time that thought visits, what used to cause stress, depression, joy lives. Absolutely. Same thoughts, laughter, rather than depression. Because underneath the thought always, as you like to say, is the fact that we are love. And yeah. it's, it, in a way, it's pretty simple, mm -hmm. but in a way, it's extremely complex, and that's why you having formulated a four or five question methodology that seems to work really well for people. I, I'm wondering if we could, and I know you've done this a million times, but I'm wondering if mm -hmm. we could quickly go through the four questions and oh, turn around. Oh, absolutely. Um, this um, one of the books you mentioned, I have a story in it that it's the true story of a woman whose husband left her to live with the next door neighbor. So every day this woman watches him um, come home, fall into this other woman's arms. She watches them sit out on the porch together, hold hands, and, and her uh, life is miserable. She's full of rage. She's uh, neglecting her children, neglecting her life. Her addictions are kicking in. And um, then she found the question, these four questions. And the first one, or I'd say the first two, is it true? Can you absolutely know that it's true? And the thought that was bringing her so much misery is, I want my husband to come back to me. And when she hit that second question, can I absolutely know that it's true? I want him to come back to me. Her mind opened. And what happened in that open-mindedness, a whole other, whole other options, whole other truths came to her. What she found was, just for a moment there, Oh my gosh, I don't even know if I want him to come back. That was a thought that was so out of her reach. It was, it was um, quite something for her. And then she hit the third question, how do I react when I think that thought? And that was clear to her. She was miserable. Her addictions had kicked in. Her children were being neglected. Her home was being neglected. And then the fourth thought, who would I be without the thought? Who would I be without the thought? I want him to come home to me. And it hit her like a ton of bricks, that it was the thought 
she had been walking around with causing the stress, not her husband. In fact, her husband wasn't even there to upset her. Her thought, I want him to come home. So you can see, Jordan, she was arguing with reality. And if I argue with reality, I lose, but only 100% of the time. And then she, of course, turned the thought around, and uh, I want him to come home to me. And she flipped the thought, I want me to come home to me. It changed her life. It all came into focus. And she began taking care of herself, her children, her home, her life. Everything shifted, and then she became, you know, very happy that the woman next door was being so kind to someone she loved and actually never wanted to live with again. Her awareness had shifted to the point where she saw that it was a favor that life had brought her. It was a gift, in fact, and what she had wanted in her life actually was not what she really wanted. What she really wanted, she got. And that's how I see life. Anyone that questions their mind comes to see that it's not what we want in life, it's what we have that we want. And that's true of every moment, and it's true of every human being. And until we can see that, our work's not done. We're simply believing what we think, and that is very, very painful. No, it doesn't work very well. No. No, you know, um, confusion is the only suffering on this planet. This planet is a wonderful place. <clears throat> what we believe about the planet, now that's not so wonderful. That's the only hell we suffer. Now, your work has been compared to a lot of things. You know, uh, Buddhism, cognitive psychology, um, the, the Course in Miracles. Today I put up the four questions in the Passover Seder. You know, yeah. Four questions. Where else have I heard four questions? Mm -hmm. But it, it seems to me that, I mean, I know your background is, is that you weren't heavily studying any of these things when you had your yeah. whatever you had. And you came to this naturally, honestly. And that's why I think in a way it's so practical. Mm -hmm. Because while other people can try to, you know, pin their ideas mm -hmm. and on you, it's, uh, it, that's not what this is about mm -hmm. for you. You're no. expressing what what came to you, and, and now you teach it. It's said in one of your materials, hundreds of thousands of people. Now. Yes. Yes. It's a, it's a wonderful privilege to, um, to not only experience a wonderful life, but to give people the same ability. And it's so simple, uh, the ability to find the same thing inside of them. But the questions actually, no matter what we compare it to, the questions actually are nothing, there's no power in them other than as a key to a person's own answers. And it's a person's answer. You know, that's where the power is. Well, it's the willingness to actually <clears throat> do the work to start to unlock your mind. Because we yes. have such powerful minds these days. Yes. And we're so, yes. you know, and that thing about, you know, people would really rather be right and unhappy than be with what is. Yes. Right and, un and, and unhappy rather than... You, you know, and also, Jordan, everyone would be happier if they could. You know, it's, we would all find a way if we knew what it was. And these questions unlock that. They're a key to our internal. They're a key to our mind. The key to how to open the mind and giving the mind permission to open. And the turnaround kind of settles us again so we can begin again. It, it brings us back into a position of direction.